So please welcome Srinivas Krishnan, Senior Software Engineer at Google and Rajatta Joshi, Product Manager at Google. So hi folks, um, really excited to be here. Uh, I think I know about 25% of this room. So the interesting thing is I have worked, um, I started my career at Cisco, then I worked at Brocade. Uh, I used to be an engineer in my past life. Then I managed a team for three years. Then um, I gave all of that up to work in open source. So I was the product manager uh, who took Onos open source as an SDN control plane. And then I thought, why are we building these boxes? And why are we doing all of this? We can do all of that, but we can also do it in the public cloud. And so right now I'm at Google, uh, working on the cloud networking team, and then working on all of the network services as well. So, and then I have with me Srinivas, who will come on board. And we thought we'd make it fun. So for the first maybe 15 minutes, uh, we'll talk about like what is the Google Cloud uh, what constitutes it, what does the network look like, what do the network services look like. And then we thought we'll add some fun by having Srinivas come in and then dive into the Andromeda technology. So how many of you have heard uh, about Google's software-defined network virtualization stack Andromeda? Okay, so he's the person to ask questions to. <laughs> so if you really think about Google, I think this is most people's uh, this is what comes into their minds. And a different way to think of it is basically this. If you really think about Google and its own services, it's about seven cloud products with a billion users each. And so what we are doing with Google Cloud essentially is making all of this technology and then all of these innovations available to basically anybody that wants to deploy their workloads in the cloud. So I wanted to start with basically talking about the global footprint of Google. So where exactly are, for instance, the data centers, or what kind of network exists in there? Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, either Google Cloud or other public cloud providers? Okay. So the nice thing about being, in a, being a public cloud provider is that you control the entire stack. So you have your network. You can innovate on that network. You can deliver services in any form factor that enables you to get scale and basically resiliency. And then you can provide all of this on which your customers will come and build their virtual networks. So if you look at the, if you look at the map there, if you see whatever is in uh, green, those are all of the current regions. And so a good way to think of regions is that it is comprised of multiple availability zones. And then you can roughly think of an AZ as mapping to, let's say, a data center. If you look at all of the gray spots, those are basically points of presence. And so if you're connecting to any service in the Google Cloud, that's the first part where you're connecting to. And then between the pop and the service that's running in one of those green or blue blobs, basically there is Google's network. So this is uh, a very well-provisioned global network and it's got hundreds and thousands of owned uh, fiber optic cable. So if you control the point where the user connects, and you also control the point where basically the network takes you all the way to your backends where your instances are there, then you have a lot of control on the characteristics of the package. So you can really cut down latency, you can dramatically improve, improve performance, and then you can also scale out across this network as well. So we have this global network, and then there are tons of innovations that we have leveraged to actually bring you uh, like services or to bring you even deployments in the Google Cloud. So I think if, you, if many of you have been attending Open Networking Summit, uh, Amin Vaidat from Google comes in, talks about uh, these innovations, like at least there's one new innovation that he talks about every year. And so if, you, if you've heard about our software-defined WAN, uh, which is B4, uh, he spoke about it a few years back. Uh, then there's Jupyter, which is essentially our data center interconnect. And then you get basically one petabits per second of bisection bandwidth to serve all of our network services. Then there's Andromeda, which I will leave for Sri, and then he will deep dive into it. And then if any of you attended uh, Open Networking Summit that's been going on, 
uh, they spoke about Espresso, which is essentially our software-defined peering edge. So now you take all of these, um, you take the network and you take all of these innovations, and what we did is we took all of that, we packaged it into the Google Cloud, and the Google Cloud networking specifically can be thought of as the following areas. So the first thing any customer does when they come to Google Cloud is they want to go and create a deployment. So you're used to creating your networks and your sub-networks. And um, generally in a data center, your networks are layer two, and now they're moving to layer three. Uh, in the public cloud, you will notice that all of the networks are layer three. So they don't really have layer two networks. So the VPC is basically your virtual private cloud. And then we'll, we'll deep dive into it, so I'm just uh, going to stop at that right now. Once you've done that, the next thing is, how do I control who can access what in my virtual network? Once you're done with that, then you want to scale your application. Uh, maybe you're growing, so you want to just handle that growth as well. And then lastly, almost, actually not almost, but a large percentage of our users either have hybrid cloud deployment, which means uh, they have an existing data center on-prem that they want to connect to Google Cloud, or they are multi-cloud. So they have more than one cloud provider, and then they connect up those networks as well. So let's start with VPC. Um, the term is somewhat nebulous in that uh, different providers use it differently. Uh, a good way to think of it is, so you have all of this infrastructure, but then each customer needs their own isolated piece of the Google Cloud, and that's essentially your VPC. The thing to note, though, is while the term is used pretty frequently by a whole bunch of, uh, let's say, different providers, they mean different things based on the provider that's actually using them. So I've just taken the example of what is traditionally meant by the VPC in most public cloud providers. Think of it. Let's say you started off with users in two regions. And if you see the tiny red dots on the maps, basically these two deployments, one is in US West and one is in US East. Now, if you notice, each of these gray boxes is a VPC. And if for some reason these two VPCs need to communicate with each other, you'd actually have to put a VPN gateway and then communicate across the internet that way. This is what a tra traditional VPC is. So your VPC is regional, and it cannot talk cross-region without actually going through a VPN gateway and then through the internet as well. So imagine if you had to add one more region you have to again go through this setup again, and you cannot seamlessly expand as well. <clears throat> so I want you to now talk a little bit about the difference uh, in how we use the term VPC. So what we just spoke about is basically the image on the left. And if you notice, you cannot directly communicate between the application servers in the two regions. If you look at Google, Google VPC is basically global. And so what that means is just those two red dots, you can easily go uh, put two subnetworks that actually cover each of those regions, or you can put both of them in a single VPC. So if you notice in here, those two application servers across both of those regions are talking in private RFC 1918 space without going through the internet. And the way they are communicating with each other is basically through Google's global network, so the one we just saw. And it's going all of those uh, cables, and it's going through all of those um, uh, wires that you saw in the previous diagram. So I, th I think the first difference is that Google Glo VPC is global, and most others, actually all others are regional. But a lot of things on how you deploy these VPCs essentially depend on your organization. So imagine that you're an enterprise. And let's say you've got dev team, and you've got a test team, and you've got a prod team. Now, you want all three of these to share the network, but you want to give them some uh, control on what they can configure. So let's look at one example. So look at this one. So in Google, we have this um, entity called a project. And that is where it's basically a unit where you go and apply your billing, and then a lot of the permissions as well. And then you go and configure the VPCs inside this project. Uh, we also have another notion called the org node. And so if you look here, the org node is basically the overarching node for all of these projects. And in between that org node and your individual projects for the team, 
you have the shared network. And so this is a separate VPC where you configure the network, and then all of the child projects essentially share the network. And this is some interesting characteristics. We won't have time to go into that. But the idea is to show you that this is one model. Now, now let's contrast this with another model. The two, there are two different organizations. They have their own VPCs. They don't want to share anything, but they actually do want to talk to each other. So it's a more formal relationship. And in here, we have what is called VPC network peering. And so now once you've established that peering and you've given requisite permissions to each side, then something in project A can go talk to something in the peered project B. And so if you need the reverse to be true, you have to configure that peering as well. So there are a number of other such constructs, but the whole idea is that you get choice because one size doesn't fit all. So that's the whole idea. One of the other things I wanted to point out is um, typical firewalls, right? So you will have uh, appliances, either they're hardware, they're software, uh, the NFV style, uh, cluster style, multiple ways you can, you can deploy them. In the Google Cloud, the firewalls are enforced on the host itself, on your VM itself. And what that means is there's essentially no choke point in your network. So that is where the term distributed comes from. And then each direction, like a traditional firewall, is considered separate. So there's an ingress, there's an egress, and uh, you can put controls in the ingress, egress, or both, both directions. So once you've figured out what kind of topology you want in the cloud, so you've picked one of these um, regions where you want to put your workloads, uh, you've figured out which VPC topologies work for you, the next thing you'd want to do is to scale your services. And a lot of our users in, are in multiple regions. So let's say somebody um, who has a service that runs in two regions. Uh, they would go and put their backends in those two regions, and then they would want to scale it, most typically by using a load balancer. So how many of you are familiar with load balancing? I think probably almost everybody. So the whole idea is to not think about that about our load balancing like that at all. And I can say that because I used to be an engineer who worked on load balancers, so I can say that confidently. But the whole idea is um, how do you actually handle, let's say, uh, VMs that are sitting across the globe, and how do you ensure that somebody who's deploying in the cloud can seamlessly scale that application across all of these regions? Because you're giving them a global VPC, uh, what use is it if your load balancer itself is regional? And so I'm going to deep dive into the first three flavors, which are our global flavors. <coughs> so I said it's different, right? So what exactly is different? Uh, so let's, let's not think about the traditional load balancer for now. We spoke about the POPs, and we spoke about the data centers, and then we spoke about the network that connects them. And so if you look in here, uh, the load balancer that you see is actually sitting at the pop, the gray circles that you saw. And these are essentially globally distributed scalable systems. Uh, and they are basically, all, again, software defined. And there's more than one of them. Uh, they, they talk to each other, and they actually do all of the load balancing right there at the pop. And then they send your traffic to the closest available VM in one of the closest mm -hmm. available data centers. And so at this point, again, there is no choke point, And then you can seamlessly scale across the globe as needed for your load balancing as well. And in fact, uh, at GCP Next recently, we also demoed IPv6 global load balancing. <coughs> so at a, in a very generic sense, if this was, um, let's say, a regional load balancer, then you notice that you've got instances in three regions, and you would have had typically three WIPs. And as opposed to that, what you have in here is a single WIP, because if you look at your DNS, it has one V4 and one V6, and that can front end your backends in any region. So we use this technology called Intelligent and Stabilized Anycast. And so that is what enables us to deliver this specific feature. Uh, one of the interesting examples where the performance was tested recently is Pokemon Go. So uh, most of you have probably played Pokemon Go or heard of Pokemon Go. But uh, one of the things that happened was uh, Pokemon Go folks themselves didn't know that it was, it was going to be so popular. And so the actual traffic was 50x of the traffic that they expected. And as you can imagine, uh, we had to scramble to help them scale. And so they deployed their backends, the Pokemon Go, behind the HTTPS load balancer. 
and then the actual app was running in containers on our uh, Google Container Engine. And we were able to have handle that traffic seamlessly um, across the globe, wherever the users were. So once you're done with deploying your VPCs and you've scaled your apps, the next things that you want to do basically is to optimize. And a typical mechanism, again, is caching. And so that is what you see here. There's a bunch of options that you can go and explore in there. So I'll skip this slide. Basically, talks about it's it's very similar to the load balancer in that it sits at the edge. Just like any anything else, um, you should look at the latency performance actually for all of these. So I won't go into it in detail right now, but then I have added links in the slides for all of the latency measurements as well. So once you have your VPC and once you have your load balancer and once you have your CDN, what mm -hmm. you need to do is to connect your hybrid deployment to whatever you've instantiated in GCP. So there are a number of flavors that you can use. And a very good example of that, so we spoke again about this at uh, GCP Next is Home Depot. And so if, if you want to learn more about how they connected it. So the interesting things to see are, are they connecting, are they communicating across the two using public IPs? So we're like uh, non-RFC 1918 space, or are they using RFC 1918 space? Because then you would select different types of interconnect options based on how you want to connect up as well. And the last thing is, anytime you're managing a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud deployment, the most important thing is basically find the right tools to manage it as well. And now the last bit. So one of the things that scares, or used to scare at least enterprises and other folks about moving to the public cloud is, is the cloud secure enough? And so a good way to think about cloud security, especially from the networking point of view, is uh, first start by securing your VPC. There's a bunch of tools that show up in the blue there. Then when you interconnect your on-prem to GCP, uh, use the right interconnect options. Uh, supplement this with third-party virtual appliances, uh, be it firewalls or any of the next-gen IDS IPS systems as well. Uh, use the Google Global Load Balancer because it has inbuilt L3, L4 DDoS protection. And then um, you get Google's high-capacity network. So if, you're, if you do get attacked, you have the capability of scaling across regions to even absorb the attack, plus the network itself actually absorbs some of the attacks. So this, uh, in fact, uh, I wanted to give the example of Evernote. And Evernote migrated to the Google Cloud. And one of the biggest endorsements they gave is they were not only able to match the security that they provide on-prem, but they were also actually able to provide more than what they, what they could on-prem. So there's a blog post link, uh, which is also a pretty good endorsement about the security in the public cloud, especially Google. So I know this is a whirlwind tour, and I took you through a lot of the features. Uh, but I wanted to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes with Sri, uh, who will walk through Andromeda, which is our SDN uh, stack. Thanks, Projector. So we've seen a lot of our products discussion, and now I'm going to do uh, a deep dive of Andromeda. So Andromeda internally uh, is our software network virtualization layer. So it is what powers uh, Google's compute engine network. And in this talk, Overall, what we're going to really talk about is we saw the slide initially about all our different points of presence. And one of the things I want to talk about and have you take the message is how do we actually interconnect them with software-defined networking? So this talk or this part of the presentation is going to be in two pieces. First is we're going to talk about the control plane overall. And a couple of topics we want to cover. The first one is how we do isolation across our different virtual networks. Um, so let's say, for example, there are multiple users who are in different, uh, the same data centers. So let's uh, the orange line and the green line over here, and a third one comes along. Every one of them is guaranteed uh, certain performance characteristics and certain latency throughput characteristics. And the control plane that we build guarantees that. So we're going to see how we do that. Uh, the second thing I want to convey is how we have built the system for scale. So for example, uh, we can spin up 100 kVMs across the network in 184 milliseconds. It's pretty astounding. And then finally, uh, the control plane is built for high availability. So three, four, five. So uh, you have three ninths of availability in a zone. You combine that with multiple zones in a region. You get four ninths of availability. And you take that across the globe, you get five ninths. And we'll talk about how we achieve that. 
And then uh, we should spend some time inside the data plane itself, how we have built the core network functions inside the VM host itself, um, and how we're also supporting uh, constant evolution of our features. Uh, we're able to push these features out almost weekly, and we do this using data plane upgrades and live migration of the VMs. So quick overview, um, a control plane uh, is hierarchical. So the very top sits what we call the cluster manager. The cluster manager is responsible for uh, various pieces. For example, it's responsible for storage, it's responsible for compute, and one of the pieces is also responsible for networking. And underneath that, uh, everything is split into regional, zonal, and cluster level components. Uh, there's the regional fabric manager, uh, which programs, is exposes an API to program the virtual networks that we have. And then below that, uh, we have what we call VM controllers. This is where Andromeda starts. And this is a cluster level managers. And that program essentially open flow rules uh, to our OFEs. At the very bottom, a software defined switch that's built into every host. There's our data plane. And then we program using open flow rules. Hey, forward. Uh, so this slide is supposed to talk about how we do high availability and scaling. So we took one of the snapshots of the earlier slides and we blew it up. So here is you have the fabric manager for a VMC, an, an OFE for a single cluster and a single host that we have. The first thing that we want to guard against is uh, hardware domains, uh, hardware failures. So for that, the VMC is triply replicated and it also has a singly elected Paxos master. So it guards against machine failures. We also want this to be scalable. Uh, so what happens is the OFE is also sharded, so it's able to take care of multiple different hosts. And we take this concept uh, further. Uh, we also shard uh, that replica itself into multiple different OF VMCs, so that let's say we want to do horizontal scaling. What that means is if you bring up a new rack of servers in our data centers, we can easily just bring up a new set of the control plane tasks and provide that uh, new uh, uh, the new capacity to our users. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, programming models. So initially when we started Andromeda, um, we started with a very simple model. It's a pre-programmed model. Uh, it's a full mesh. It works fairly well for small networks. Uh, that's primarily because when you program it, you have low latencies when VMs want to communicate. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you can see there are some scalable uh, some scalability challenges for this because as you scale up, uh, you have to program this full mesh and it's quadratic. So traditionally in OpenFlow, you have a on-demand model. Um, so traditional OpenFlow has a learning packet model where you don't program the flows. So the first mess actually goes up to the controller and on demand, you program the flows. Now this has some issues. Uh, first of all, it exposes the control plane to packet floods. Second of all, you have latency, uh, which is unpredictable depending on how loaded the control plane is. So we combine the two uh, into a hybrid approach, uh, which we call hoverboards. And hoverboards essentially is a software gateway. You can think of it as a default router in your network. So we don't program initially any flows, and the VM wants to communicate, it directly goes to the hoverboard, which forwards it to the next VM. This gives you low latency. For small networks, we still go ahead and pre-program it because uh, the overhead for that is fairly small. For large networks, because it goes to a default gateway, we also wanted to have a mechanism where if the flows that are going to the hoverboard get large, like elephant flows, uh, we can send them directly back to the host and you get point-to-point -point connectivity. This allows us to scale the hoverboards better and also do capacity planning better. So with that, we're gonna switch modes into the data plane. Uh, so we've been doing this for a bit now. Uh, the first thing we did was Andromeda 1.0. Uh, it was very simple. It had kernel open vSwitch, it had open vSwitch control plane on top and the hypervisor. We improved that with Andromeda 1.5. We added live migration support, which is pretty huge. Uh, and then we added different offloads. The huge evolution came with Andromeda 2.0, uh, where we moved the entire data plane into user space. Um, so there's, uh, we got rid of the open vSwitch con uh, kernel module, and we have the entire data plane now in user space. The next steps that we are working on is bypassing uh, is hypervisor bypass. So the first step is in Andromeda 2.1, which is rolling out right now, where we do hypervisor uh, bypass with the guest OS directly talking to a user space next. And in the future, we'll be doing full hypervisor bypass 
uh, with the guest OS directly talking to the hardware NIC itself. So I want to talk really uh, quickly about what we do with our data plane. It's kind of neat uh, because we're able to do native hardware performance fully in software. And the design looks something like this. We have a fast path which can, op can provide up to 2 million PPS. And the way we do that is the uh, fast path is very simple. It does packet forwarding. Core processors is a feature that we introduced, which does CPU intensive functions, and the packet processing for CPU intensive functions is offloaded to these. And there's an on host control plane, which is based on OpenFlow, uh, traditional vSwitch D, uh, which controls all of this. So there might be a question why build this in user space? Um, so it has a lot of advantages. The first one is security. Uh, because the overall code footprint is so small, uh, it also runs with no root. That pretty much means the entire data plane requires no privileges. We can also do continuous fuzzing uh, because of the code path, uh, the code footprint being small. We can also build in technologies like ASLR directly into the data plane itself. The second thing it gives us is improved robustness. Unlike a kernel bug, which can take down the entire machine, the user space process, if it goes down, can come back right up. The second thing, sorry, the last thing is rapid. So weekly, we can go ahead and we can swap out our data plane with a completely new data plane because it's all in user space. So we can do release, uh, releases every week with the headless upgrades. Uh, the data plane is also fully programmable. So what that means is that uh, the control plane can program the OpenFlow rules and also the data plane itself. It's actually pretty simple. So if you look at traditional OpenFlow, you have your table. Your, for in this specific example, we have an NCAP table, a DCAP table, and some other special function table. But when it boils down, at the end of the day, uh, it all programs into the, open, uh, the data plane itself, which is a key action-based uh, data plane. They also enhanced overall the open vSwitch layer uh, with different extensions. Uh, so the extensions that we built are, for example, load balancing. So OpenFlow right now, or Open vSwitch doesn't do uh, stateful load balancing, and we added that. It also did diff different features for us, like SAS and billing, and also does policy enforcement. Finally, the network functions are implemented directly in the data plane with the coprocessor module I discussed earlier. So we have things like traffic shaping, uh, DOS and abuse protection, and different new features we introduced in directly built in the coprocessor itself. So I want to do a quick study, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, a project after that. So internal load balancing uh, is a product that we announced recently in GA in January. Uh, so if you look at a typical uh, deployment, it has a uh, L7 load balancing, which is what project I talked about. And after that, at the very back, there is the internal, which needs to operate in RFC 1918 space. A traditional approach has a actually a box, a load balancing box, which does the load balancing for you. But we took a different approach for this. Uh, we don't have any boxes. The load balancer itself is client side. It's built as one of those co-process we talked about directly into the client uh, VM host itself. That pretty much means there's no choke point in a network. There's no big box that has to be provisioned. It is all done based in a horizontally scales as you spin up more VMs. There are other features that is built into the uh, load balancer itself because you want to package it up as a full network function. We have things like automatic health checking, which feed in updates to our load balancer. And as VMs get healthy and unhealthy, we're able to move things away and drain traffic away from those lower, different backend VMs. And all of this is, again, controlled fully by OpenFlow. So this is how we package up a full system. So it builds up from the very bottom. You have a network function, which is a co-processor module. Uh, you have a control plane, which programs it fully using OpenFlow. And that, I'm going to hand it over to Projecta for a recap. So I just wanted to end with one slide. Basically, we wanted to give you a flavor of things that exist uh, for you as users as well un as under the hood. And we have just touched the tip of the iceberg. So you do have a whole lot more set of things that you can experiment and play with. And this is mostly networking centric. Uh, when you start looking at Google Cloud, there is actually it's really famous for the data side of things, so analytics, data, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the big things that we didn't cover today is uh, container engine. And so that would be definitely something to look at, uh, especially this Kubernetes on the open source side uh, where the community is growing by leaps and bounds. So 
Uh, for those of you who are developers, do look at gRPC, do look at Kubernetes. And at the end, I did put in one or two tools that are not Google, but that are very popular on the Google Cloud platform. So one of the things we really wanted to end with is that Google is an open cloud, and we believe in multi-cloud, we believe in hybrid cloud, uh, we believe in an open cloud, and which means it's probably great news for you as a developer. So uh, with that, we just wanted to take any questions, and then uh, feel free to get hold of us afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is about the Antimeda. Um, so you mentioned uh, there's no um, uh, sort of an SDN controller kind of thing. Uh, do you have? Sorry, uh, there is an SDN controller. I didn't. Uh, but it's in the hybrid method. It goes oh, you to the gateway the, and uh, for you mean the uh, the the flow the the programming model. Flow, flow yes, programming absolutely. Model. Okay. So uh, do you uh, program any preemptive flows, or everything is done dynamically? Yeah, so for the small networks below a certain threshold, we still pre-program because it's still uh, And uh, how are the uh, external networks created, right? Suppose you do, um, this is at a low level, uh, you can do the flow programming, but right. once you go into L3, how do you do that? This is L3, these are layer three flows that we program. At the uh, internet work? So it got to the internet, uh, so those are, uh, so that's a good question. So that's also fully software defined. So by the way, uh, if I didn't convey that, none of these are L2. There's completely, we work at layer three. And uh, so Expressive, for example, if you had that talk, it's also connected. The fabric that connects all of this is Andromeda. So we pre-program flows as needed. It also goes to the edge. So we are able to say you want to, for example, if you want to go to a GFE uh, from the thing, be able to say the software defined open flow rules also provision that as well. Did you use any uh, DPDK kind of thing, or just uh, small? Uh, that I can't actually talk about much, yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to add to the question you're asking, so there is an SDN control plane, but the typical model of an SDN controller, uh, it, it goes beyond that in that it's like global, and then it's distributed, and it's federated, and then there is it's hierarchical as well. So it, it goes to that extreme as opposed to being like the typical uh, clustered uh, form of SDN control plane. You mentioned you believe in hybrid cloud. Um, so the question is, is any of this toolkit, or specifically Andromeda, is it one open source, and two, is it available for me to run on my private cloud? It is. Um, yeah, so this one, let me take that one. Um, so the question is, do you really want to run Andromeda, right? You can, you can leverage it on Google Cloud. Uh, if you really want to run some, something in a hybrid mode, one of the things you should be looking at is Kubernetes. And so what it gives you is, so if you have workloads that you containerize, you essentially have, that is basically your container orchestration. And you can use that on-prem, and then you can use GK, which is the managed version, because if you deploy on-prem, you have to manage the scaling and so on of the control plane as well. So I think that's almost everybody is going towards that model, and then almost going to the no server or like, you know, the cloud functions type of model. So I wouldn't say take Andromeda. I would say go take GK to your network. That would be the right way to do it. There are a couple of questions that side, but uh, we'll, if, if the audience doesn't mind, we'll just take one question, and then we're going to the break. So and they'll be there, so we can, yeah, we can take that up. Yeah, actually, um, uh, um, I want to ask something about uh, your. I think I um, just one question on the load balancing one. You are saying that you are using client-based load balancing approach, right? Yes. Does that mean you require some additional software to be? No, sorry. Uh, if I didn't make that clear, the, the client side load balancing, the load balance is built in the client VM host, uh, but it's not. Uh, you don't require any special software to be installed inside your VM itself. So it's still layer three load balancing. Okay. The load balancer itself is. Think of it as a module that plugs into as an NFV on the VM host itself. But there's no box. 
but uh, there's no separate box for uh, load balancing itself. Okay, and the other, the other question is, the, you said that you don't use any OR list, right, in this particular VM to VM communication. Yes, uh, uh, the um, uh, VXLAN type of tunneling. Yes. Uh, how do you use the um, uh, overlapped addressing or any such type of? So we still use tunnels. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a you can think of a different end cap format. It's not, um, oh, it doesn't need to be NVGR. There's still uh, the software defined overlay is still tunnel based. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I think I just wanted to add one thing to what Sri said. So. When you asked about the client side load balancer, right? In in like very quickly I showed this one slide where there were two boxes. One was called the global load balancer, one was called the regional load balancer. And so everything that's in the global part, there were three flavors, like HTTP, HTTPS for your HTTP, HTTPS traffic. For your traffic that's not HTTP, then there is and if it's encrypted, there's SSL proxy. And then for the unencrypted non HTTP traffic, there's TCP proxy. Below that, there was a thing called regional, and in that, it was internal load balancing, which is implemented using Andromeda, which is what he talked about. And then there's a network LB, which is implemented using Maglev. So under the hood, there are actually three technologies, the Google front, Maglev, and Andromeda. And each flavor is implemented differently, but we abstract that out. Yeah, I, I just remember my question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is it a kind of a class-based architecture sort of thing where uh, the edge nodes or uh, spines Typically, what is the number of flows you are looking at? Uh, what is scale? Uh, if uh, you know, I'm just trying to see if you're using open flow rules and uh, what's the scale. So, if you really think of Google Cloud, you are not really seeing the close part, close part of it at all, right? That's under the hood for you. So, a good way to think of it is the underlying infrastructure, which is Andromeda, or which is uh, Jupyter, which is basically the one that's providing you the data center interconnect. And that's where all of these like spine leaf technologies and others would come into play. When you're looking at a virtual network, think of it like you're going there. You're saying, give me a network which is uh, called ABC. Put two subnetworks in there, one in 10, 10, 10, 0, slash 16. One is, let's say, uh, another subnet in slash 24. And so from your perspective, it's just that, like a set of compute, storage, and other resources. And then you put some addressing on them. So you never see any, you don't really have to worry about anything under the hood. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend looking at the talk on Jupiter, which was done, I think, one or two years back at ONS. That's under the hood, basically. Okay, so the yeah. uh, question is that, um, which means each node doesn't, what's the maximum number of flows we are looking at? Uh, I mean, what's oh, the scale? For every open flow rules, for example, what's the max you are? Uh, yeah, for uh, every every switch, uh, every v switch, which you showed in the picture, uh -huh. so what would be the maximum number of rules, open flow rules? In a typical scenario, it depends on the uh, well. It, it it depends, right? For example, it also first of all, it depends how the regions it is in. Uh, the diff if it's an edge node, if it's not an edge node, uh, if it's a VM host, and then how many different VMs are there. Uh, so the answer is dependent on that. So for a VM host which is heavily loaded, you can see tens of thousands of flows, maybe. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.